Thank you, just like my classes. Is this on? Yes. Good morning and welcome to our spring academic lecture series. This morning it's my great honor and privilege to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Dr. George Yancey. As prelude to that, let me provide you with a bit of context for his visit. Here at Covenant College, as you know, for you are a part of it. Our communal calling is to engage each other in the broader culture in the search for truth. Each day in our offices, our residence halls, in the chapel and administrative offices, and occasionally even in the faculty lounge, depends on the day, we labor to identify, discern, understand, and proclaim the truth. And this is no easy matter. We're in some variant of a postmodern context, or as Professor Davis might say, an I pluralist world. We live in a world where truth is twisted, massaged, distorted, spun, disregarded, and fashioned after our own liking. We live in a world where Donald Trump may soon be president. And so I think it's significant that as we collectively face this present crisis of truth, this rupture of reality, this climate of less than voracious verity, Dr. Kapik, who holds primary responsibility for organizing our spring lecture series, felt the need to bring in a sociologist. This, I believe, bodes well for our future. You can feel the spirit of God at work among us when an accomplished, noted, and prolific theologian like Dr. Kapik brings in a sociologist that we may know the truth and the truth may set us free. <laughs> Things are looking up, my friends. I've known Dr. George Yancey for the past decade or longer. He's been part of the Association of Christians Teaching Sociology, now the Christian Sociological Association, for quite some time and is highly regarded by our members. Dr. Yancey's presence at our June conference always adds a dimension of scholarship and insight that is appreciated and welcome. Many of the graduate students who participate in our association come from the University of North Texas, where they know Dr. Yancey as an outstanding Christian academic mentor. Dr. Yancey is married to Andromeda, and together they have a young son, Leo, who's nearing his first birthday. I suspect these trips away from home are a time when he catches up on his sleep. I follow his posts on Facebook, and his obvious affection for his wife and son are both infectious and delightful. If you peruse Dr. Yancey's impressive list of publications on Amazon, you'll find he has authored and co-authored numerous books on such topics as race, interracial dating and marriage, multiracial churches, and anti-Christian bias in the academy, just to name a few. His most recent scholarly efforts investigate media bias. In this lecture series, Dr. Yancey's chapel talks will focus on race, and his lecture this afternoon, which we encourage you to attend, it's at 4 p.m. in Sanderson 215, will focus on anti-Christian bias in the academy, the subject of one of his recent books. I encourage you to attend and listen to his lectures on both these topics in the hope that you come away edified and better informed about how we might think about and respond to several pressing issues manifest in our culture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Yancey. One slight correction. My dissertation chair once told me that sociology is the discipline that you don't go into, you have to have absolute certainty. So we'll, we bring a type of truth, but it's not the sort of truth that I think we find in the Bible. Uh, I want to talk a little bit as, as a Christian in academia that one of the things that drive me as a Christian is that I believe my faith should make a difference. I believe it should matter. In other words, I should be living my life differently because I'm a Christian. I should be thinking differently because I'm a Christian. I should solve problems differently because I'm a Christian. One of the things that disheartens me as an academic is when I see Christians who try to solve the problems of the world the way the world solves the problems of the world. And with this, what I want to do today and tomorrow is look at, is there a Christian solution to one of the big problems of the world. Is there a Christian solution for racial problems? Now, we know there's not a Christian solution for everything. There's very few Christian solutions for physics problems. And you can pray 
but there's few Christian solutions for mathematical problems. You should study instead of just praying, too. But on moral issues, we Christians should have a unique take. What could that be? First, are we still dealing with racism? You know, with, with the uh, recent incidents with Donald Trump, uh, this is almost a stupid question at this point. And I didn't even think about, you know, I didn't even add that when I was thinking about are we still dealing with racism? Because sometimes in the past, we talk about racism and people say, well, we, we dealt with that. Uh, well, I think it's pretty clear that we haven't dealt with that. If we had dealt with racism, we would not have a Black Lives Matter movement. Now, I'm not saying this to agree with everything the movement does or is about, but this sort of protest shows the level of racial alienation we still have in our society. As you probably know, the Black Lives Matter movement is dealing a lot with uh, the police, uh, police force, as it interacts with African Americans in the community. Uh, their presence shows us that we still have a racial problem in the United States. Campus unrest, if you just follow along the news, we see these uh, campus protests, not, all, not just on racial issues, but often on racial issues. Back in, what was it, Yale, where there was, there was problems because of Halloween costumes. Once again, I'm not taking sides, I'm just saying this is an indication that we still have these problems. Why do we still have ghettos and barrios? I don't know, maybe, maybe they're enlightened here, here in Georgia. Do you have black sections of towns? Do you have Hispanic sections of towns? Why? Team nicknames? All, all the uh, uproar over, over the Washington football team's nickname? Uh, why are we still fighting with this if race has gone away? And why do we still have churches that are mostly black, mostly white, mostly Hispanic? I mean, if, if we dealt with racism, why do we still have these sort of institutions? In fact, the churches are, more, are less racially integrated than most of our schools and neighborhoods. So we still have a serious problem. Okay, so we have a problem. What can we as a church offer? Well, we've got to understand where we're coming from. Now, let's look at this real he here. Imagine the top of the triangle is common American beliefs, beliefs that almost all Americans believe. And then imagine whites and, and non-whites, and then these are racial issues. We know that whites and non-whites disagree with each other on racial issues. You can see how far apart they are. Well, what if we just looked at Christians? Would they be closer together, or would they be farther apart? And research shows us they would be farther apart. In other words, we in the church disagree with each other more than non-Christians. Is that the way we should be? Is that the way we should approach it? It is a Christian solution. Why are we further apart than, we, than, than the rest of the world? I did some research a little while ago, about 10 years ago, and I did some research looking at people's choices in dating. And what I found out was that Christians were more open to dating someone of a different faith than a different race. The average Christian was more willing to date a Muslim, Jew, what have you, than someone that was different from them racially. We have serious problems. Okay, so the problem of race is still here. How should we deal with it? One thing that I've done in my, my work is look at what I call models for dealing with with racial issues. A model. Think of a model, you, remember when you were a little kid where they had those little t toy ship models where you put it all together and, and then you, know, you got either a ship or a boat or, or something like that? Well, there's different models that we have that when we put it all together, that's how we're gonna deal with the racial issues. There's four basic models we have in our society on, and this is just in general on how people deal with racial issues. I want to very quickly look at them you know, my time does not permit me to go into them very, in, in a great deal of detail, but I think you'll recognize them. Uh, colorblindness, angle conformity, multiculturalism, and white responsibility. Here, colorblindness. The colorblindness model argues that we will have racial harmony if we ignore race and forget past historical discrimination. Concentrating on the advances we have made and acting in a colorblind manner is the best way to overcome racism. So when people say, look, you want to deal with racism, forget about race, ignore race. 
you know, you people bring up race, you're, you're causing all the problems because you bring it up. Just ignore race. That's a colorblind way of dealing with racism. The next one is angle conformity. This is a model that encourages racial minorities to accept European American values. Answer to racial strife is to help minorities imitate how whites have moved up the economic and social ladder. So these are individuals who say, if we want to deal with racism, what we have to do is help people of color to succeed economically. Uh, they, uh, what about people of color? Their families are falling apart. They're not getting married. If they would just get married, work hard, go to college, they would succeed. They wouldn't have, would have all these racial problems. That's an angle conformity model. Okay, multiculturalism. This deals with race, with racial alienation by emphasizing the values and worth of minority culture. Racial minority individuals and their subcultures are held in low esteem by the dominant society, so we must find worth in those individuals and cultures. Now, most of us have been exposed to multiculturalism to, in one form or another. Uh, the emphasis of the different cultures, uh, trying to point out that the majority culture, the white culture, is not the only one that is there. Uh, and, and we see this as a model. The problem the people with the multicultural model will point out is that you still have a lot of the dominant group that insists that their culture is the best, that their culture is the one that we should pay attention to. So those are the people that are having problems. Those are the people who are getting in the way of stopping are problems with race relations. That's a multicultural model. And then there is what I term the white responsibility model. This locates racial problems totally within majority group culture and individuals. Have you ever heard people say blacks can't be racist? Racial minorities cannot be racist? since they lack the economic and social power of whites, solutions revolve around the total empowerment of racial minorities. So this is a model where people say, look, the problem is white people. And whites have all the power, and people of color, they don't have power, they can't be racist. If you pay attention a lot to Black Lives Matter and what they're arguing, this is the model they're operating out of. The problem is whites don't listen to people of color, whites need to be allies of people of color, and if whites get their act together, then we can solve racial problems. All right? Now, these are four general models. I fully understand that some people go back and forth between some of them, and it's not an exact match with every single person. But if you think about it, when most people talk about racial issues, they tend to rely on one of these four models greatly. The question I ask is, is this all that we have to rely upon? or is there something else that we can do about race relations? Because I see these models as models that humans have created. They are human models. One thing you, you may have known about the, all these models is they find some other group to blame. All these models say, those people, it's their fault, if they get their act together. Now, who those people are changes. But it's constant about those people, it's their fault. They're the ones who did it. And here's where I think that perhaps we Christians can add some in insight. All these models fail to recognize that human sin impacts us all. What racial group is not impacted by human sin? There will be none. We are all impacted by human sin. And when you're blaming other people, oftentimes you're not looking at, am I to blame? We've all gotten into arguments with, with, with individuals. You know, Facebook has really helped that out, right? Facebook's really brought us together because now we get into arguments with people we never even know and never see again. You know, and, and you know, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but oftentimes, don't we forget that, hey, you know, sometimes I'm being a jerk too? So it seems to me that a whole is a Christian model would seek to harmonize all of us, regardless of our failings. In other words, if we're looking at a, at a Christian model, it can't be a model where our focus is on blame of others. It's what us humans tend to do. We tend to blame others rather than look at ourselves. So I would argue 
The problem with all the, mar all the models is that they don't truly take into consideration human depravity. Human depravity, the notion that we're fallen creatures, that without Christ, without God, we will remain fallen, uh, that we ourselves have failed. These models, what they do is focus on human depravity for a selected group. But if we're honest, and this goes back down to, do we really believe what we believe? Do we really believe that all of us are fallen? If we do, then we can't have a solution that focuses in on just one group or another. We have to have some sort of holistic approach. Let me show you how human depravity affects all these models. And once again, you know, I know I went through the models really fast. Uh, if you're interested, I have a couple of books out there that go more in more detail, uh, Transcending Racial Barriers and Beyond Racial Gridlock, if you're, if you're interested in that. But uh, I just want to quickly show, uh, I know for many of y'all, buy another book right now is like, you just want to put a drill bit to your head instead of doing that. But, uh, but if, you know, at one point when you actually do have money again in your lives, you just may want to consider it. Pitching books to college students that it's not recovered for their class is not a way a person makes a whole lot of money. Uh, human depravity. Human depravity convinces whites to ignore racial issues and keep the status quo. Because human depravity, when whites can just focus in on what they want in our society, and given that we know a lot of research out there, once again, I don't have time to go into it, a lot of research out there shows that European Americans have uh, a superior position in our society to others, then it's in your interest then, to keep things the way it is, and to ignore problems that people of color face, and to say, to people of color, you're the problem because you're bringing up racial issues. Don't bring up racial issues. We all love each other, go along together, and that's great. You know, it's cultural like if you had a basketball game and congratulations to your team. If you had a basketball game and the ref's been, you know, calling against uh, your, you know, another team uh, until you have a 20 point lead and says, okay, now we'll, be, now we'll call it fair. Hey, you got a 20 point lead. That really matters. So human depravity convinces whites to just ignore racial issues. That's part of human depravity. We don't always recognize that. It convinces whites that people of color have created their own problems so that when we look at some of the poor communities, when we look at some of the devastation of racism, have you all been to Native American reservations beyond, beyond a powwow and seen the level of housing that the Native Americans live in? They were here before any of us. And look what's got them. Uh, and Anglo-California says, well, you know, those Indians, they just have been lazy, and they just need to go ahead and get to, go, go to work. That's human depravity, folks. That's sin. When we ignore the problems, when we ignore the issues that historical sin has brought us, and blame people for being the receivers of that, that's human depravity. That's sin. And that's saying these people are responsible and I bear no responsibility. In fact, Anglo-Formity says, hey, if they just been, if they're just like me. You're just like me, everything would be cool. But you know, Anglo-Formity also, I'm sorry, human depravity also plays a role in multiculturalism. Because it says that you know, the uh, people of color, that all the problems reside within the culture of the majority group. That the culture of the majority group is the culture that has all the problems. But didn't we just not say that all racial groups have human depravity? So are we going to say this culture is problematic, but this culture is not? And there's really a philosophical problem in multiculturalism, too, that people don't want, want to really deal with. And that is, if we really do say that, you know, all cultures are basically equal, are we really saying we are not going to make a judgment of other cultures? Are we going to say that, well, you know, Nazi Germany is not the culture I like, but hey, you know, all cultures are equal. Because philosophically, if you really buy multiculturalism to, to, to the uh, logical conclusion, that's where you go. Now, is this human depravity? Yes, because once again, we're looking to blame others rather than working through the issues ourselves. 
and white responsibility convinces people of color that they've done nothing to create racial alienation. Now, anyone who studies race fully recognizes that for the vast majority of our history, and even today, European Americans have a, a power by and large over people of color. But to say that people of color do nothing to create racial alienation is not accurate either. We know of people of color who, went, and we can sympathize with the pain they've gone through, but when they lash out, helps to form it more racial alienation. An example of this, you know, just to use that example, we can sympathize where people have come from, but still not excuse the actions. You know, oftentimes, people who have been abused as kids grow up to be abusers themselves. We can be sympathetic with the abuse, but we have to control their actions later on. So if people have been abused, but they go on to abuse others, maybe not in the same way, but I've seen actions from people who are involved with racial justice, which are inexcusable, then we have to confront that. But human depravity says, no, don't confront that. They've been hurt. The, the blame is always on whites. We will always put the blames on whites. That's an attitude of human depravity, the in unwillingness to see one's own sins. So as you can see, I don't find any of these models convincing because all these models have been shaped by a human depravity that we're going to have to overcome. The problem gets back to our sin nature. Our sin nature puts whites in a position to defend the status quo, whether it is just or not. If you are European American and you live in a society that has worked towards your favor, it is in your interest to defend that. It is not in your interest to, to ask the question, is this the right thing to do? Now, I'm not saying that you're an evil person who wants to, you know, put your thumb down on people of color. All I'm saying is that the natural human sin nature tends to blind you to what might be happening because it's not happening to you. That's what human depravity does. Human depra our sin nature. Our sin nature puts minorities in position to constantly criticize whites whether they are right or not. So the flip side of this is that if you're a person of color and you've grown up in the American society and you've had to deal with racial issues and you have some grievances, some justified, some may not be justified. Sin nature, because it focuses on gratification of self, puts you in position to criticize whites, whether it's justified or not. To sometimes play the victim, whether it's justified or not. Most of us have probably met people who live out a victim mentality, who are always see themselves as a victim, and we know how difficult that is in dealing with, uh, with a person in a relationship because they're constantly looking for how people are victimizing them. Sometimes that happens. That's our sin nature. So I would argue that our sin nature, both groups do not have an incentive to care about the other group. In a nutshell, we can see a lot of this today. We can see a lot of the conflict in race today from uh, groups not having an incentive to want to care about the other group, whether it's right or wrong. Rather, they in their own group interests push for certain ideas that will benefit their group, regardless of whether it's right or wrong. And barriers are erected that keep the group separate. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting watching race relations play itself out today, because undoubtedly, in many ways, we've come a lot farther, uh, especially lately, than, than, uh, than we, we have in a long time. I remember a time when it was almost taboo to interracially date, and now it's almost taboo to say you don't want to interracially date. Uh, I remember a time where racial epitaphs were you know, I won't say everyone was using them, but it was not uncommon. 
and today you'll be stigmatized. And yet we still have this, this level of alienation and animosity and barriers, this mistrust. Pay attention, if you will, to some of what's happening with some of these campus protests, the Black Lives Matter movement. Pay attention to what they're saying. Uh, oftentimes, they bring up issues of violence that we need to pay attention to, but then sometimes the way they enunciate it, I cringe because I know it turns people off automatically. They're, these individuals don't seem to, to care to reach out to those who disagree with them, and neither do people who oppose them want to reach out to them. These barriers are here, and it seems like we don't know what to do with it. And the answer is, is there a Christian solution that can get past this? Because these, these models have not worked. They've not worked. We can't just say, let's ignore race. We can't just blame whites for everything. We can't do this multicultural thing, and we can't do this anglo conformity thing. Is there a solution that we as Christians can do that would begin to ease or break down these barriers and provide a witness to the rest of the world? You know, if we actually got race or light right in the church, in our Christian colleges, people would pay attention to us in ways they would never have before. Because we'd be solving a problem that they lust to solve. But we've not gotten it right. And that's a shame on us. Well, I know that today is one of your normal chapels, and I'm told that tomorrow is, is a bonus chapel. And, you know, sometimes I fear you think that that might be like bonus homework. You know, oh yes, more homework. Uh, so let me just say why you should come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, today I've been going to the problem. Tomorrow I want to discuss an approach grounded in scripture that helps us with these models. Notice I didn't use any scripture today. Today I was Mr. Sociologist. Tomorrow I'll be Mr. Sociologist slash theologian. The theologian will be a very weak theologian. You know, that, that's, that's definitely not my strong suit. You know, it's my interpretation of the scriptures. I think there is a Christian, <coughs> a Christian approach. I honestly do. I think it's a hard approach. But if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? So, if I've got your curiosity, come back tomorrow. I'll give you my approach. And then after that, you can go, I came back for that? I hope I see you all tomorrow. <laughs>